Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Gerhard Kasper, the trustee in residence. Some of you may remember me from 2015-16 when I served as a president at Interim. Uh, it is my great pleasure tonight, and I'm glad you have come in large numbers, uh, to invite you to uh, Daniel Sieblatt's Axel Springer lecture. Now, my task is to say a few words about our speaker. And uh, some of it is very simple. He got his higher education in California, of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, for somebody like me. Uh, uh, a BA in German studies and politics at Pomona College in Claremont. And then his PhD at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Daniel's PhD was entitled Structuring the State, the Formation of Italy and Germany, and the Puzzle of Federalism. Now that is a very intriguing title, and I, I apologize, Daniel, I have not actually read it. Uh, I've read <laughs> your other books, but not that. Uh, but I, I will one day. Uh, now for his dissertation, I'm emphasizing the dissertation because for his dissertation, Daniel received the Ernst Haas Award for Best Dissertation in European Politics, given by the American Association of Political Science, and the Gabriel Almond Award for Best Dissertation in Comparative Politics. Since both Ernie Haas at Berkeley and Gabriel Almond at Stanford were my friends, I will admit uh, that uh, had I been given either of those awards, which I, of course, have not, I would be greatly pleased, <laughs> greatly pleased, and feel greatly honored. Uh, 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 Ernie Haas was, of course, the founder of studies on European <coughs> integration, and uh, Almond was one of the great people in American political science working on a subject not irrelevant to uh, what Daniel has been working on, and that is civic culture. And he made a very big point of the importance of civic culture in political development. In 2003, um, Daniel joined the Harvard Department of Government, where he is now the Eton Professor of the Science of Government. I confess, uh, Daniel, that I would prefer if the professorship were named for the science and art of government. <laughs> but obviously Harvard has a very strict view of what science is and applies it to government, and so be it. Uh, Daniel has published much. Most recently, two books um, that I have read. First of all, and I, I brought them. You see, I, I brought them uh, because I believe in show and tell, uh, but also because if you are ever asked whether you have seen Daniel Sieblatt's book, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, you can say, yes, I've seen it. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, this is, uh, is one of the books, and uh, the other is the one I guess we will hear more about tonight, How Democracies Die. Uh, as between birth and, de and die death, you are covering the whole spectrum. Um, <laughs> The first book, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, uh, received four prizes. First of all, the Woodrow Wilson Award of the American Political Science Association, uh, which is given to the best book published in the United States, uh, on, uh, in the United States on government, uh, uh, politics, and international affairs. The second prize, the same book got, was the Barrington Moore Prize of the American Sociological Association, uh, given to the best book, of course, and so on. The third prize came from the Comparative Democratization, was a Comparative Democratization Book Prize of the American Political Science Association, and the fourth was European Politics and Society the European Politics and Society Book Prize, also of the American Political Science Association. 
that is quite an accomplishment and probably not matched uh, by many political scientists. How Democracies Die has so far been translated into 15 languages. What's the most obscure language uh, it was translated into? In what? Albanian. Uh, Albanian. Albanian. Okay. <laughs> Including Albanian. Uh, uh, did you read it for its correctness? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Uh, the book looks at the political system of the United States and examples from different periods and areas about democracies turning into autocracies. Uh, for instance, Peru, Argentina, Hungary, Turkey, Russia. The book, which uh, I have also read, uh, is extremely well written, and I warmly recommend it to all of you. And now I warmly recommend you to all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard, for the very nice introduction. Um, I, I was walking through the lobby on the way here, and I had the distinct feeling that I was at my wedding because I recognized everybody. It's sort of the last time I felt this way, and I wanted to say hi to everybody, but I had to rush in here. But my wife and kids are here, so I knew it was not my wedding. Um, uh, it's really very nice uh, to be here, um, and it's, I'm the last speaker of this semester at the American Academy, and it's really been a magical fall here, um, and now, approaching winter. There was frost on the grass this morning. And I think I really speak for all the fellows in saying that. And also in thanking all the staff here who've been remarkable and the funders of the American Academy, uh, and in my case, uh, Axel Springer for funding my fellowship. So I'm really profoundly grateful to have been able to spend the last uh, four months here. So this fall, I've spent a lot of time interviewing politicians and journalists and academics about German politics. But on a kind of more personal level, I think while being here at the American Academy, I've also spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, sort of in between breakfast in my, in my apartment, uh, transatlantic relations. Because, you know, this center was set up, as everyone knows, I think, in the mid-1990s, at the high point of warm feelings between Germany and Europe and the United States, and a high point of enthusiasm about democracy. You know, this was, after all, the era of, in which history had ended, and I know there's a picture of Francis Fukuyama out there to testify to that moment. Um, but in, in fact, when you walk around the building, I have to admit that I sometimes feel a little bit of uh, kind of nostalgia, because you know, I look on the wall and there's pictures of Helmut Schmidt and Johannes Rau and George Schultz and Bill Clinton, and it's easy to think that this is an era that has passed in some way. Um, you know, actually a couple of weeks ago we heard of uh, George Packer talking about Richard Holbrook and the subtitle of that book is The End of the American Century. And so there, it's tempting to think that, you know, maybe institutions like this are, a, are somehow a construction from an earlier era uh, and that maybe it's time to move on. Um, you know, I think actually that's absolutely wrong. Um, I feel very deeply that this place was founded, I mean, this is a guess, but this place was founded precisely to prepare ourselves for a moment that we're in right now. Um, and that's actually really needed now more, more than ever. You know, as the US and Germany and other countries in Europe face a set of shared challenges, I think it's really important to have a forum in which there can be sharing of lessons and, and, and kind of a collective learning. So in that spirit, um, yeah, thank you. I'll sit down now. Um, um, in, in that spirit, I, tonight I wanted to talk to you about the predicament of American democracy and um, talk about how we ended up, how and why we ended up in the mess that we're in um, and what lessons uh, possibly there are for Germany uh, today. So I, I think to begin that conversation about the, the, the mess that America is in, it's useful to have a broader context. And it's, it's clear, I think, that we live in an age of disruptions, this is often said, um, uh, it's, uh, technological, sociological, economic, and political as well. And one of the biggest political disruptions, I think, is that the way that democracies die has changed. Democracies used to really die at the hands of men with guns, 
uh, and military coups during the uh, Cold War, three quarters of democratic breakdowns came in the form of military coups. You have generals, tanks in the streets. The president would have to flee the country. Today, though, contemporary democracies die in much more subtle ways. They die at the hands not of generals, but of uh, presidents and prime ministers who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert democracy. So constitutions often remain intact. Uh, parliament continues to meet, continue to have elections. And so citizens aren't fully aware of what's happening until often it's too late. Uh, in 2011, a survey was done in Venezuela asking people whether they thought they lived in a democracy. This is well into Chavez's regime. And a majority of Venezuelans said they lived in a democracy still. <coughs> Similar numbers one can find in Turkey uh, and Hungary as well today. So if democratic breakdown begins at the ballot box, then one of the key things to uh, protect democracy is to, protect, it's to prevent extremists and demagogues from getting into office in the first place. And this is actually where political parties play a major role. Um, political parties are, are, we don't really think of them often this way, but political parties are democracy's gatekeepers. Because they select the candidates for office, they have the power to keep extremists out. And so when parties fail to play their gatekeeping role, that democracy tends to get into trouble. So it's important to remember that I think that elected authoritarians usually don't get into office on their own. They usually, they're usually outsiders and they usually get a helping hand from mainstream politicians, mainstream political parties who see them on the horizon and out of miscalculation or a kind of opportunism, they, they try to tap into the appeal of the outsider and form alliances with them, thinking often, hubristically I would say, that they can control the outsider. The thing is, is that this, back, this bargain often backfires. It's really a reoccurring pattern. I mean, we can go back to the 1920s. Uh, Giovanni Giletti, uh, the liberal statesman, saw Mussolini on the horizon and decided to include Mussolini on his party list at parliamentary elections. This had the effect of legitimating Mussolini, and, and Giletti was soon long gone. Uh, this similar kind of set of events unfolded in Germany in the late 1920s. Uh, Alfred Hugenberg and the Dan Falpe, the uh, conservative party, um, held joint events with Hitler and tried to, trying to tap into the appeal. Hugenberg, if you've ever seen pictures of him, was a stuffy guy, um, saw Hitler and thought, this is somebody I can use. Um, this turned out, of course, to be a tragic miscalculation. So this is a reoccurring pattern. In America, we're come, talking about America today, uh, American political parties have actually done a pretty good job of gatekeeping. This is important because in the United States, we sometimes forget that there was a long, there's been a long history of demagogues. We tend to whitewash our history, but you think of just about Henry Ford in the 1920s, uh, the founder of Ford Motor Company, a famous anti-Semite who also wanted to be president. Um, Huey Long, the autocratic governor of Louisiana uh, and senator from Louisiana who had presidential ambitions. Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s, the red-baiting senator from Wisconsin. George Wallace, the segregationist governor from Alabama who ran for president in 1968 and 1972. So each of these figures were incredibly popular. Gallup poll data, you can look at Gallup poll data going back to the 1930s, and each of these figures garnered around 35% approval ratings, uh, which is an interesting number, 35%. I mean, it's about Donald Trump's approval ratings. So the difference, though, is that none of these figures ever made it close to the White House. So the question is, how were they kept out? And one important part of the answer is they were kept out through the presidential candidate selection process, the way parties selected candidates. Before 1972, uh, American political parties selected candidates for the presidency through a kind of convention system uh, that we often think of as the system of smoke-filled back rooms. This wasn't a very transparent system. It was not inclusive. It wasn't democratic. But it served as a quite effective filtration system for keeping out extremists. Party leaders acted as gatekeepers. They engaged in uh, what scientists of politics, scientists of government, call peer review. Social scientists, scientists like peer review. What do they mean by this? What peer review means in this case is that party leaders who had worked closely with potential candidates knew their strengths, knew their weaknesses, knew how they responded to stress, how they dealt with adversity, and who might be potential demagogues. These were the ones who selected the candidates. And so for all of its shortcomings, and I wouldn't advocate going back to the old system, the old convention system had a basically perfect record in the United States of keeping demagogues out. Mm -hmm. Under this old system, it was impossible for somebody like Huey Long 
or uh, Henry Ford to be nominated by a major party. So most of these kinds of figures didn't even try. So what happened in 2016? Well, the first thing I think that happened was that the American system adopted a system of binding primaries in 1972. This is a bit of what the SPD just introduced and selected its party chairman uh, this past weekend to select their party chairman. The primary system you know, is certainly much more democratic. It's more open, it's more transparent than the old convention system, but it also, of course, weakens the power of party leaders. So if a demagogue, somebody like uh, uh, Henry Ford, really decided to run for office, it would be much harder to keep that kind of figure out. And that's what we saw in 2016. Henry Ford was really the Donald Trump of his age. Henry Ford wanted to be president, had lots of support, considered running, but whereas party gatekeepers kept Ford far from the presidency, Trump uh, got in the door. Now, after Trump's nomination, Republican gatekeepers failed a second critical time. Uh, Juan Linz, a, a great Spanish uh, political scientist who was born in, um, in Weimar, Germany, and grew up in, in Spain during the Civil War and taught for many years at Yale, and is an inspiration to me in a lot of ways. He uh, spent his career studying democratic breakdown and, and, and related topics. And, one, and he, one of the key lessons that Linz drew from the, and, and other political scientists drew from looking at these interwar years and the failure of democracy is that when would-be authoritarians emerge, Democratic politicians and democratic political parties must do everything possible to keep the authoritarian far from power. This may include making great sacrifices. Resisting a demagogue on one's own side is actually very, very difficult. It risks angering your own base. It may even mean short-term political defeat. And, and of course, no politician likes to lose. That's a law of the government of science. <laughs> But politicians often rationalize. They often tell themselves the demagogue maybe won't be so bad. Maybe they can control him. Or at least they think maybe they can ride the demagogue's popularity to power. Um, and at least it's better than the other side winning. Again, this is a really a terrible mistake. Linz made this point forcefully. When faced with a would-be authoritarian, I'm going to quote from Linz. He says, politicians must, when faced with an authoritarian, politicians must join with opponents ideologically distant but committed to the survival of the democratic political order. You must make alliances with those on the other side of the aisle to defend democracy. This is really a central lesson from Linz, uh, from the interwar years. Republicans didn't learn this lesson or didn't have this lesson in mind in 2016. They didn't heed the lesson. Donald Trump was in his rhetoric clearly indifferent, if not outright antagonistic to basic democratic norms. And to all leading Republicans, uh, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, who openly suspected him of this and knew what a risk he was, nonetheless endorsed him. And even John McCain, whose picture I think might be out there, who recognized the threat, withdrew his endorsement of Trump, which was a good thing to do, but he refused to go to the next step and, and endorse the political rival the Democratic candidate for president. And so in short, no major, no major Republican leader did the one thing that Juan Linz would have recommended to do, which was to, when, when facing a threat of democracy, which was to endorse the ideological rival. And this sent a crucial and I think crystal clear signal to Republican voters. It told Republican voters this is a normal two-party election. And in a moment of a kind of uneven economy, a normal two-party election can go either way. In the context of the so-so economy, it happened to go Trump's way. Gatekeeping had failed. So now for the first time in more than a century, I would argue, the United States has a president with overtly weak commitment, that's I think putting it mildly maybe, to constitutional and democratic norms. <laughs> um, we have seen the results, I would argue, over the past three years. And this is where our institutions are really supposed to come into play. Um, because Americans place a lot of faith in their constitution um, for good reason. The U.S. has the oldest written constitution in the world. The system of checks and balances has contained many uh, ambitious presidents in the past. Uh, you can think of Andrew Jackson, um, Ulysses S. Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Nixon. So why shouldn't it contain Trump? And it might. It might. But the constitution, I think, really, we have to remember, is by itself does not, will not save us. Constitutions aren't self-enacting. They don't just work automatically. 
Uh, if they did, a country like Argentina, whose constitution in the 19th century was nearly an exact replica of ours, I mean, in fact, two thirds of the text was essentially plagiarized in a, in a good way from the American constitution, uh, it, would, it should have been a stable democracy. But instead, over the course of the 20th century, Argentina experienced six military coups. So the point is the words on the page aren't enough. Constitutions work best when they are reinforced by unwritten rules, uh, or, or what we can call uh, democratic norms. The, uh, in, our, in the book, How Democracies Die, we focus on two in particular. Um, one that we call mutual toleration, or the idea of accepting our partisan opponents uh, as legitimate. So this means no matter how much we disagree or even dislike our political rivals, uh, we recognize, at least publicly, that's a minimal requirement, publicly that they are loyal citizens who have an equal and legitimate right to compete for office and if they beat us, to govern. So in other words, we don't treat our rivals as enemies. The, the second norm is the norm uh, that we call, a little more unfamiliar perhaps, that we call institutional forbearance. Um, so forbearance means refraining from exercising one's legal right. It's an act of self-restraint, an intentional underutilization of the power. So now we don't often think about this uh, norm in politics, but it's really vital. If you think about what a president of the United States is constitutionally under the law able to do, the president can pardon whoever he or she wants whenever he or she wants. Any president with a congressional majority constitutionally can change the size of the Supreme Court. If you don't like how the Supreme Court is ruling, expand it, add more judges with the people that you sip, that are your allies. Perfectly legal. If a president's agenda is stalled in Congress, the president can circumvent the legislative process and rule through executive orders. The Constitution doesn't prohibit this. Think about what Congress can do. The Senate can use its right of advising consent to block all of the president's cabinet or Supreme Court picks. Congress can refuse to, govern, refuse to fund the government, shutting down the government, which is something we've seen uh, recently. And of course, Congress can impeach the president on basically any grounds it chooses. So the point is that politicians can exploit the letter of the law in ways that totally eviscerate the spirit of the law. This is a, a kind of dynamic or a phenomena that the legal scholar Mark Tushnet calls constitutional hardball. In Deutsch, of Deutsch it's Hatta Verfassungsbandage, is the German translation, which is okay, I guess. But um, looking at any, if you look at any failed or failing democracy around the world, you will find an abundance of constitutional hardball. So Argentina under Perón, Spain and Germany in the, in the 30s, in the early 30s, Venezuela under Chavez, contemporary Hungary and Poland. Constitutional hardball is how even brilliantly designed constitutions get subverted. It's how checks and balances, balances degenerate into gridlock. It's how watchdog institutions get turned into lapdogs. So just to give you an example um, from Argentina, the 1853 constitution that I mentioned before um, uh, was, you know, again, modeled directly on the American constitution, but it was not enough to check Juan Perón. So one of the first moves that Juan Perón made when he became president in 1946 was to have Congress impeach three out of the five uh, Supreme Court judges on grounds of malfeasance, a move that was technically legal. The Peronist Congress then passed a law making it a crime to disrespect the president. Um, so an opposition leader was arrested because opposition leaders disrespect presidents under this law because he had criticized the president. Uh, he challenged the law, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, of course, though, was packed with Perón's allies. It ruled against him. The opposition leader was sent to jail. All of this was legal. What prevents a constitutional system of checks and balances from descending into the kind of constitutional hardball that can wreck a democracy is forbearance. It's a shared commitment to the notion of restraint in deploying one's institutional prerogatives. Think about presidential term limits in the United States. So before 1951, the US Constitution placed no legal limit on presidential reelection. So legally, if reelected, a president could be president for life in the United States. Yet George Washington, very famously, stepped down after two terms, and for nearly 150 years, no president ever sought a third term. Even popular, ambitious presidents like Jefferson, Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant ever even sought a third term. It was an unwritten rule of self-restraint that mattered. Take the filibuster, another example of forbearance. Technically, a Senate uh, minority can use the filibuster, so this right of talking, to block every single piece of legislation, to make it impossible for the majority to govern. 
but the, the, historically, the filibuster has been rarely, was rarely used in the United States. It was really a, treated as a weapon of last resort. So between 1917 and 1960, the first part of the 20th century, there were only 30 filibusters, one a year, roughly. So the point is, these norms of mutual toleration on the one hand and forbearance on the other are what we call the soft guardrails of democracy. They help prevent healthy political competition, which is necessary for democracy, from degenerating into a kind of partisan fight to the death that can wreck democracies and has wrecked democracies in Europe in the 20s and 30s and Latin America in the 60s and 70s. Now, America hasn't always had these guardrails. It was not born with them. Uh, America's founding fathers actually really never quite got the concept of mutual toleration. Um, and that is because this idea of a legitimate opposition of people who disagree in politics, uh, this idea was just emerging at the, in the West at the, in, the, in the 18th century. So as brilliant as the founding fathers were, they couldn't quite wrap their heads around this idea. So under President Washington and President Adams, the governing Federalist Party regarded the uh, emerging Jeffersonian opposition as seditious, as working for revolutionary France. The Jeffersonians weren't much better. They regarded Adams and Washington as monarchists and wanting to restore British rule. And so, it was not, and so they both engaged in hostile uh, constitutional hardball, court packing, um, the Sedition Act, essentially almost outlying uh, uh, opposition. So it's not really until the post-revolutionary generation, the Martin Van Buren generation, the 1830s after this, that the notion of mutual toleration really took hold, and it didn't last long. In the 1850s, Southern Democrats viewed the new Republican Party as an existential threat. As slavery emerged as an issue, the Republican Party became the party that was seemed to be against slavery, and so both sides regarded the other side as a traitor to the republic. As norms eroded, these newly emergent guardrails began to break down. Politics took, up, politics took on an anything goes kind of character. So in the decades in the, leading up to the Civil War, in the, in the last decade, in the 1850s, historian Joanne Freeman actually counts 125 different acts of violence on the floor of Congress. Fist fights, canings, stabbings on the floor of Congress. So mutual toleration had obviously collapsed, and it obviously collapsed even further during the Civil War. And it remained low for a generation after the Civil War. During Reconstruction, both sides viewed the other side as existential enemies. And so the 1860s and 1870s were replete with constitutional hardball. An impeachment of a president was launched, 1868. Supreme Court nominees were blocked. The Supreme Court size was changed and expanded again, 1866, 1869. It was a disputed presidential election in 1876. Then for very tragic reasons that we discuss in our book, beginning in the late 19th century, Democrats and Republicans began to accept one another as legitimate and began to avoid destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball. In particular, what happened was the Republican Party gave up on the cause of Reconstruction. In effect, giving up on the cause of racial equality. So Republicans pulled federal troops out of the South and allowed Democrats to uh, disenfranchise blacks in the South. So African-American voter turnout in the U.S. South uh, in 1880 was 61%. In 1912, it was 2%. Southern Democrats, whose voters were all white, no longer viewed Republicans as ex existential enemies. So a kind of tragic truce was rest rest restored. Mutual toleration was restored. Forbearance reemerged. And so this tragic irony of our history that we live with today is that our norms of mutual toleration and forbearance, from my view, at least, preconditions for democracy were achieved at the price of racial exclusion and single party rule in the South. So our democracy was fundamentally incomplete, but it also meant that beginning in the early 20th century, constitutional hardball diminished. There were no impeachments or successful court packings. Senators were judicious in their use of the filibuster and their right of advice and consent. Outside of wartime, presidents didn't use executive orders. And so for more than a century, from the late 19th century to the early 20th century, to the, to the late 20th century, for this century, our system of checks and balances worked. But again, they worked because they were reinforced by these norms of mutual toleration and forbearance. Now, um, it won't come as news to any of you that these norms have been unraveling over the last uh, quarter century. We've seen this dramatically accelerate 
I think, in the past three years. But it's important to recognize this decline of mutual toleration and forbearance that we witnessed today began long before Donald Trump. It began in seriousness, I think, in the 1990s. So Newt Gingrich, uh, who became a House uh, Speaker in 1995 in the early 1990s, told his Republican allies that when talking, and the new members of Congress, when talking about Democrats in public, use words like betray, anti-flag, anti-family, traitor. Gingrich was also a master of constitutional hardball. He organized the first government shutdown in 1995. Three years later, the Republican House uh, carried out a mostly partisan impeachment of Bill Clinton. It was the first impeachment since the 1860s. The process of norm erosion really accelerated in the 2000s. During the Obama era, the Tea Party movement radicalized the Republican Party, encouraging them to abandon mutual toleration. Republican leaders like Newt Gingrich, Sarah Palin, told their followers that President Obama did not love America, and that Obama and the Democrats weren't real Americans. The birther movement, including Donald Trump, some of you may have not heard of this phrase, the birther movement, but maybe you have, went a step further, questioning whether President Obama was even born in the United States, thereby questioning his basic legitimacy to be president. I'll give you uh, one example. Colorado Congressman Mike Hoffman declared at one point, I do not know if Barack Obama was born in the United States of America, but I do know this. In his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American. Hillary Clinton received similar treatment. Uh, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump repeatedly called her a criminal, and Republicans chanted, lock her up live on national television during the convention. So I, as I've said already, and I, don't want, I want to make sure I emphasize this, there's always been an extremist fringe in American politics. But this was not fringe politics. These were national Republican leaders. This was the party's 2012 vice presidential candidate, the party's 2016 presidential candidate. Leading Republicans now were, for the first time in more than a century, denying the legitimacy of their Democratic rivals. Again, this is, this is worrying, important to note, because what we've learned studying other democracies in other places and other times is in the absence of mutual toleration, if you regard your rivals as enemies, then politicians are tempted to abandon forbearance and to engage in an escalating spiral of constitutional hardball. If we, review, if we view our partisan rivals as enemies, we view them as an existential threat, then of course we'll use any means necessary to stop them. And that's exactly, I think, what's begun to happen. Politicians have begun to throw forbearance to the wind. Now this was already visible, I think, in 2010, when Republicans won control of Congress. Uh, they adopted a strategy of outright obstructionism and you know, publicly said that their goal was to ruin the Obama presidency. Um, filibuster use, I think this is a useful indicator, filibuster use, which had already been rising both at the hands of Democrats who were engaging in constitutional hardball and Republicans, reached an all-time high during the second term of President Obama's uh, two terms in office. In the four years of his second term in office, there were more filibusters than in all of the years between World War I and the end of the Reagan presidency combined. President Obama responded with constitutional hardball of his own. When Congress refused to act on immigration reform, on climate change reform, he circumvented it and, and, ruled and made policy via executive orders. These, again, these actions were technically legal, but I would argue violated the spirit of the Constitution. So by the end of the Obama presidency, Republicans, in particular, I think, seemed willing to adopt any means necessary to prevent the Democrats from winning. This was visible at the state level, where 15 states, all of them Republican, adopted strict voter ID laws between 2010 and 2016, and also in national politics. The most stunning example of which, in this, from this period, I think, was the US Senate's 2016 decision not to allow President Obama to even hold hearings to fill the Supreme Court seat made uh, vacant by the death of uh, Anthony Scalia. This move was unprecedented since 1866. So all of this, again, I'm going through all of these examples because all of this was before Donald Trump became president. So the problem is not just that Americans elected someone who I think we can call a demagogue in 2016. It's that we elected this demagogue at a time when the soft guardrails protecting our democracy were eroding. So why is all of this happening? I believe uh, what's shredding our norms is polarization. And I want to kind of clarify what I mean by that exactly. Republicans 
and Democrats have come to truly fear and loathe each other. In 1960, 5% of Republicans in a survey done by Gabriel Almond, actually, in 1960, uh, said that they would be displeased if their child married a Democrat. <laughs> a, survey, a similar survey was done in 2015. The number is 50%. According to a recent Pew survey, 45% of Republicans and 41% of Democrats said the other party's policies uh, threaten the nation's well-being. 49% of Republicans and 55% of Democrats say the other party makes them afraid. So we've really not seen, I would argue, this kind of partisan hatred since the 19th century. And this isn't just traditional liberal conservative polarization. People don't fear and loathe each other over taxes and health care. Today's partisan differences run much deeper. They're about race, religion, and way of life. So our parties have changed dramatically over the last 50 years. In the 1960s and 70s, um, the Republicans and the Democratic parties were culturally actually quite similar, although differing very much on policy. Demographically, at least, the party's leadership were overwhelmingly white and Christian and male. Three changes, though, have occurred over the last half century. First, the civil rights movement and the full achievement of voting rights and, and civil rights for all Americans in the 1960s led to a massive, although gradual, migration of Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, and while African Americans became overwhelmingly Democratic. Second, uh, the U.S. experienced a massive wave of immigration beginning in the 1960s, and most of these immigrants ended up in the Democratic Party. And third, by the time of Reagan, evangelical Christians, Protestant Christians who had been split between evenly between Republicans and Democrats, overwhelmingly had flocked to the Republican Party. So what this means is that today, the Democrats and Republicans are racially and culturally distinct. The Democrats are mostly a kind of rainbow coalition of urban and educated secular whites and a range of ethnic minorities. The Republicans, by contrast, remain overwhelmingly white and Christian. This is important because white Christians aren't just any group. They were once the majority, and they used to sit unchallenged atop America's cultural, political, economic, social hierarchies. They filled the presidency, the Congress, the Supreme Court, and governor's mansions. They were the pillars of local communities. They were the CEOs, the newscasters, and the college professors. And they were the face, crucially, of both the Democratic and the Republican parties. Those days, of course, are over, but losing a majority and losing one's dominant social status can be deeply threatening. Many Republican voters, not all, but many, feel that the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. This, I think, is ultimately what is fueling polarization. The problem is that extreme polarization can kill democracies. This is a major lesson, again, from the failure of democracies uh, in Europe in the 30s and Latin America in the 60s and 70s. When politics is so deeply polarized that each side views a victory by the other side as intolerable or beyond the pale, then democracy is in trouble. Because when an opposition victory becomes intolerable, you, of course, begin to justify using extraordinary means to stop this. Things like violence, election fraud, coups. Now, of course, Americans haven't reached that stage. But we have reached a point where, according to exit polls in 2016, the 2016 presidential election, one out of every four Trump voters, so these are one out of every four people who voted for Trump, said in exit surveys that he was unfit for office. And yet they still preferred him to the Democratic candidate. We've reached a point where Gallup reports that Republicans have a more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than of Hillary Clinton. So these are dangerous levels of polarization. Donald Trump is a symptom of that polarization, not just a cause of it, and his departure won't put an end to it. So this is my account of how we ended up where we are. Getting this story right, I think, is really important because the current moment in America is not really a fluke. It's not an accident. It's not simply what economists sometimes call a black swan event, hard to predict, you know, important, but essentially random. Um, Trump didn't just happen to stumble into office. This has a deep history. Uh, it's a history that reflects these two kind of trends that I've talked about. First, as I've said, our gatekeeping institutions are broken, which allowed an uh, autocratic-minded leader to get into office. And second, that that leader is now straining against our institutions and dysfunction results because polarization has swallowed our institutions. 
you know, the pol polarization has led to institutional warfare and dysfunction, which has reduced our politics into stalemate and made it difficult to respond to pressing issues like extreme inequality or climate change. So what I want to do in my last uh, 10 minutes or so, I think I have about left, I want to talk to you about what lessons we can learn from this story that I've told uh, about uh, for Germany. Because I think there are lessons. The rise of the alternative for Germany, the AFD, political party that is currently Germany's largest opposition party in the parliament, gains over 20% of the vote in much of East Germany, though a lot less in Western Germany, contains politicians and factions within it who, like Donald Trump, in their rhetoric, condone violence, treat political rivals as traitorous and criminal, demonstrate little respect for uh, minority rights, attack the media, and many contend, and you know, this is something that I've begun to investigate here, challenge the rule of law. Indeed, the AFD, you know, has, has a conversation over dinner just tonight, we were talking about this in many ways in speeches in the parliament, there's members of the parliament who have, who have challenged even the legitimacy of the constitution. Because of all of this, the German Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution is investigating the AFD to determine whether it is in fact committed to the, to the constitution. Now, this all poses a major dilemma for German democracy. Should the AFD be treated like just any other party, even if it represents at least some elements of it, uh, a genuine threat to German democracy? This question, of course, has extra weight in the German context for obvious historical reasons. In the background of all of the discussions of the AFD is the 20th century history of Germany. Of course, the Nazi party, though using violent terrorism in the streets of Berlin, also used constitutional avenues, used elections uh, to get into power. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, in a sentence that still haunts us today, once remarked, it's the greatest joke of democracy that it gave its mortal enemies the means by which it was destroyed. So in post-war Germany, unlike perhaps in the US until recently, there's always been a sensitivity to this notion that democracy must be defended. So the question is how? And I think there are, you know, and the question is, are there lessons from the US experience? That's, and I think there are. There's two lessons I want to talk about. Lesson one has to do with this concept of gatekeeping that I've talked about. The historical record of the US and other countries makes uh, abundantly clear, I think, that the AFD, if the AFD remains a norm-smashing political party, the major democratically minded parties must maintain their sharp commitment to not forming coalition governments with the AFD at the national level or the state level. Mm -hmm. Germany's mainstream parties must follow Wanlin's advice. Germ parties must do everything possible to not allow the AFD into power. To put it differently, no party has any particular moral obligation to form a coalition with the AFD. That the AFD can gain 25% of the vote and any state doesn't make it morally imperative to allow them to govern. It's a political choice with political consequences. Indeed, I would actually argue that it's easier in the German context to use these strategies of gatekeeping that I've talked about in a multi-party system like Germany than it is in the United States, a two-party system like the United States. Because if a politician decides that one party of many, even some mid-sized party or a small party is not coalition-worthy, there remain other options, other creative coalitional possibilities exist. So I think German parties must be ideologically flexible to keep the AFD out. So on this particular issue, I think the German CDU, the Christian Democratic Party, Angela Merkel's party, has a special role to play because the temptation to cooperate with the AFD is strongest here for several reasons. First of all, a higher share of AFD voters have defected from the center-right CDU to the AFD than any other party. So the CDU rightly worries about its right edges. The temptation is pretty strong. Second, because it's a center-right party, the arithmetic simply of coalition formation makes it more and more tempting to cooperate with the AFD to form governments. So if a firm line is not hold, held, the fear of losing power to a broad, say, left government of, you could imagine a kind of modern popular front government of Greens, Linke, and Social Democrats, the fear of this might push the CDU into the AFD's arms if a firm line is not held. The good news is that currently, the national leadership of the CDU, from my kind of interpretation of it, appears to be holding a firm line. The party's uh, secretary general has been admirably unambiguous about this. He has called the AFD even an anti-German party. Um, 
at the party's Partei Tag, the convention that I attended a couple weeks ago in Leipzig, I noted that no line received more applause than the CDU party chairman's insistence that a coalition with the AfD is unacceptable. So the national leadership is behaving as Juan Linz would recommend. So that, that's the good news. The bad news is at the local and state level, it appears there is some chipping away at this moral clarity. 17 members of the Turingen state, CDU, have recently called for a coalition in state politics with the AfD after last month's elections. And journalists have uncovered coalition packs at the local level in Sachsen-Anhalt, the East German state of Sachsen-Anhalt, between the AFD and the CDU. Now, of course, one sees all sorts of familiar rationales for this. You will hear that at the local level, the AFD is not so extreme. Or compromise is the essence of democracy, so why not compromise? This is all predictable, but it's also worrying. Because at the local level in Eastern Germany, out of the spotlight of national politics, there seems to be some evidence the firewall is decaying, normalizing relations in a dangerous way. Now, we have to remember, the historical record is clear. Such compromises usually end badly. So from my view, it's not worth the risk. I want to make a second point, though. It's, it's crucial, I think, not to confuse keeping a party out of power and halting the electoral growth of a party. The two aren't the same. So Linz's advice on gatekeeping is really about keeping parties out of power when not, they are on the threshold of power. So there's an irony. It's a separate question. Uh, of, uh, the separate question of how do you prevent a party from increasing in popularity. It's a separate question. And there's an irony when you think about these two issues because the kind of intense gatekeeping that I've just talked about and that I'm urging for potentially has the risk of increasing polarization. It may increase the view among AFD supporters that there's a conspiracy to keep them out of power. And the tighter the mainstream parties hug each other, as we've seen with the Grand Coalition, the more they are delegitimated. And this kind of tight hugging, I would put it, of mainstream parties, what political scientists call the cartelization of parties, makes mainstream parties much less popular. So coalitions have electoral costs. And it may, in fact, increase the popular appeal of the AFD in certain segments of the population. So while arguing for an uncompromising gatekeeping strategy and hard line when keeping the AFD out of power when they're on the threshold of power, I think it's not a silver bullet. And the question of how to halt their electoral growth, again, is a different one, requiring a different, more subtle answer. And here, I think, is a second lesson from the American experience. Be cautious in the use of constitutional hardball against the AFD. So let me just uh, briefly elaborate what I mean. The Germans among you already know this. Some of the Americans may not. In Germany, given the 20th century, 20th century history, there exists a constitutional tradition of Wehrhafte Demokratie, Streitbare Demokratie, Militant Democracy. So from this view, the so-called free marketplace of ideas is not enough to protect democracy. Unaided, good ideas won't simply beat out bad ideas. It will be an uneven fight because illiberals fight dirty. The German idea of militant democracy then is that in order to defend democracy, the state, in effect the coercive apparatus, the Rechtsstaat, in a top-down fashion, should be used to distinguish and differentiate between unacceptable and threatening parties and those that are not. And after a legal process, ultimately be able to ban dangerous or unacceptable political parties. Now, this tradition has been very important in post-war democracy. Uh, in the 1949 Constitution, Article 21 allows for the banning of anti-constitutional political parties. And this doctrine was used in the 1950s to ban the Communist Party and a Nazi-like party as well. However, this can no longer be relied upon. The current status of this tradition in Germany is unclear. The Supreme Court seems to be ever more and more unwilling to use this. In 2017, the Supreme Court in a way tied its own hands by deciding that the NPD, another right-wing extremist party, although it was deemed as unconstitutional or anti-constitutional, was not a sufficient threat to be banned. So this decision has made this kind of tool of banning parties into a kind of weapon that is so powerful that it can't be used. And so, although the AFD is under investigation, by all accounts, it will likely not be banned. And I think this is a good thing. Because can a self-confident democracy really ban political parties, even if it's constitutional to do so? Now, there's another approach at work uh, in the German debate, and this is rather than using uh, the state to ban parties, 
I think most German politicians that I talk to uh, kind of make the case, as I would sum it up, as deploy informal norms to combat the illiberal right. Deploy informal norms. So what's this mean exactly? That's my phrase, not theirs. What's this mean? It means don't invite AFD politicians to public meetings. It means when you don't, and when you don't, be sure to come up with very elaborate rationales for why you don't. Uh, exclude them from official panels or parliamentary committees when you can. And if you can't do that, expand or shrink parliamentary committees to dilute their impact. Change the rules about how parliamentary committee chairmen are selected to assure that they are marginal and are not running meetings. In other words, use the levers of everyday institutions, parliamentary committees, oversight committees, to socially isolate, stigmatize, and sideline illiberal authoritarians. Use the letter of the law to the max to exclude them from debate. Now, this strategy of stigmatizing, sanctioning, isolating may be tempting, and I think in some cases it may make sense, but I would urge caution here because it also runs the risk of escalating conflict. It risks turning the AFD into a victim. It is a form of constitutional hardball. Again, it's understandable and it may even be warranted in some cases. You know, who wants an AFD member of the parliament to be on the oversight board that oversees the Berlin Holocaust Memorial? Something the Bundestag has voted against. This may be morally justifiable and understandable. But my point is that even if a constitutional hardball may at times be warranted, it does entail a risk the risk of escalation, and so it must be used with caution. Because while it's possible, to, I think, to maintain a hard, an utterly hard line on gatekeeping, I think it's prudent and wise to be cautious when it comes to constitutional hardball. It may at times be necessary, but it has a risk, because polarization and escalation may result. Currently, the German political system is a system with very little polarization outside of the AfD. The political system remains, despite how many Germans I know feel, a very robust democratic system. But this could easily change. So the real challenge then in the US and in Germany is this, as long as the electoral avenues remain open, as long as elections are free and fair, democratic-minded politicians and political parties, the CDU, the SPD, the Greens, the FDP, and the left party, must figure out how to win elections and beat authoritarians at the ballot box. This is, of course, hard frustrating, grinding work. But I think the lesson of the American experience and of German history is that we can't take democracy for granted and we should be cautious about playing constitutional hardball with our institutions. There's simply too much at stake. Thank you. I think we have time for questions now. You handle your own and I'll handle my own questions. There's some microphones. Ah. And so I'm calling on people. Okay, could you, could you put your hands up again? I'm up here. Hello, my name is May. I'm from the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, and I'm very interested in what you're talking about because I actually study North American studies. So thanks a lot for this really inspiring talk. Um, and I'm actually interested where you see the future for American politics if Trump gets elected again. Like, where do you think um, the party is going, like, especially the Repu Republican Party is going? Um, a lot of people actually say that there might be a split within the party, and I'm just really curious what you think about this. Yeah, this, this question reminds me a bit. The night before the election, 2016, um, I have this friend, Yasha Munk, who sent me an op-ed that he said, I'm, I'm writing this op-ed for tomorrow in case Trump wins. And I thought, what kind of sick mind is this? Um, and I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine this scenario. And so in a way, I think I'm suffering from the same um, you know, kind of problem. You may have to ask Yasha Munk. He has more imagination. Than I do, but I no, I do think um, it obviously would would be very significant. Um, I think it would be devastating for the rule of law. I mean, it's hard; it is hard to imagine. Um, you know, especially if impeachment. You know, I mean, obviously, to reach that stage, impeachment doesn't fail. It's not clear can somebody be impeached a second time. I mean, I don't think that's possible. So, in any case, it would be you know. So it's really hard to imagine. Um, but in terms of what the political consequences are, I mean, that's sort of more my realm. Um, 
I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the uh, Republican Party has to transform itself. I think this is, I mean, I didn't say this in the talk, but I think this is really the kind of hinge of everything. Um, and I think the only way that can happen is um, if it loses repeatedly and severely. So, you know, a presidential um, loss, that's one of the reasons I would be worried about it, not just because Trump's in office, but because the kind of lesson learned would be, you know, this strategy is working. Um, so, in terms of a new party forming, I mean, generally we have two parties in the U.S., as you know, and it's and it's hard to imagine a scenario where we ever have more than two parties. I mean, rarely you get these moments and these rare moments of crisis, and you got the Republican Party, you get the emergence of a new party. You know, perhaps something like that you could imagine happening. Um, uh, I mean, I think there is, you know, there are, there are a lot of Republican, public intellectuals who have defected from the Republican Party, um, but that, you know, it, that hasn't happened at the mass level in the same way. So I think there's less kind of a mass base for that. Um, Trump, of course, has 90% approval ratings in the Republican Party, and part of that is due to the fact that there are some Republicans who no longer identify as Republicans. So there is some potential base for this. I guess one other point is, you know, we sometimes forget that Ross Perot, I mean, this may be ancient history to some and seem like yesterday to others, but Ross Perot ran for president in 1992 and got 20% of the vote as a third party candidate. So, you know, that kind of thing is possible. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, it seems so hard for that to happen now, but every once in a while these kinds of opportunities come along. Yeah, microphone, yeah, right here. Uh, yes, also thank you very much for this very stimulating uh, talk. My name is Rudy Bresser. And um, I would also uh, add on to the American uh, issues uh, because um, I don't see how, in fact, Donald Trump can be stopped from uh, getting uh, re-elected. Uh, he does everything that uh, would provoke a civilized person. Uh, he is mischievous, he is totally unreliable, uh, outrageous in his behavior, but it is exactly that type of behavior that adds to uh, the people who will vote for him. We see a similar situation also in uh, the pop culture, where uh, pop groups, for example, uh, attract youth because they're totally against establishment uh, and uh, uh, become uh, get a huge followership. And I think to some extent this also happens in politics. So I don't know what can be done. I think the uh, uh, things that probably could be done is if you find more Republican senators who cross the line and oppose him. But except for the man from uh, uh, Utah, I don't see yeah, too many who are willing to do that at this point. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm not sure. I guess I'm not sure what the question. That's, I mean, it's a good point. I'm not sure what the question was. So I, I mean, the, the one, yeah. How can you stop him? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that entirely. But I do think that, I mean, I, I wouldn't exaggerate his popular appeal. Remember, he did lose the, gen the popular vote in 2016, and it was very close. And so, you know, and, and one of the fascinating things in the debates about what caused the 2016 election, this keeps political scientists in business, is that there's a million causes that seem to be the decisive factor. You know, when an election is close, you could say, well, it was, you know, James Comey it, it released his report too close to the election. Had he not done this, Hillary would have won. Had Hillary gone to Wisconsin right before the election and turned out some voters, it may have made a difference. Had black turnout been a little bit, you know, half a percentage higher in several states, this would have made a difference. And the fact that we can come up with 100 different decisive factors shows you how close it was, because it's true. Any one of those things would have made a difference. And so, you know, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I take the point seriously that there is, you know, that there's a certain appeal, obviously, to what he does or a certain logic to what he does. Um, you know, but there's all. But I think another thing that I've come away from, and this, and this, you know, the, you know, I went to uh, high school for a year in Germany, and then I came back for college, and I studied German studies. And one of the things I was always so impressed by in the 1990s was the degree to which Germans in classrooms and then newspaper, you know, as I struggled learning how to read German, reading the newspaper, learning about debates about history and taking the lessons of history seriously. And this was sort of absent from American. 
political debate. And, but I think that's now changed. I think Americans now understand the stakes of, of not being mobilized, not paying attention in their democratic politics. And so that, that sort of makes me sometimes more hopeful. And there is, in fact, incredible amounts of new mobilization. You know, I'm, I'm trying to give a counter story to what you're saying. I mean, I, I, clearly I understand exactly the point. But I think there is uh, signs that American society has been mobilized in a, in a very healthy way, I would say, in reaction uh, to this whole experience. I want to get some people. Yeah, yes. Something. Yes. I, I do think the last point Daniel made is really very important, the mobilization. We should remember the 2018 election, yeah. where we saw a tremendous mobilization of Democratic voters and voters who were independent, and the Democrats won. The Democrats won substantially in the House of Representatives, and the Trump administration lost. This time, the election will be focused on the president, uh, as well as on the members of Congress. And uh, I think we will see again a tremendous mobilization of the voters. Remember, our voting system is extremely complex. First of all, voters have to be registered in order to vote, expressly to vote. And uh, there are many forces at work even now uh, that see to, are seeing to it that lots of potential protest voters will be registered. That's the first point. Then when, once they are registered, you have to get them to the election. We have very low voter participation in the US on the whole. And I think all of that can be changed if the Democrats and independents mobilize against Trump. And I see that as a real possibility. And, and I, I'm now going to add to what you just said. Um, uh, because that's, that's absolutely right. And that just reminds me of another point. I have a colleague uh, uh, named Theda Scotchpool who has spent the last couple of years uh, traveling around Ohio, Michigan, um, I know she's from Michigan, a couple other states, and visiting groups of activists, people who have never been involved in politics, um, who in the last three years are now leaders in their communities. And the kind of commonality of these people is that they're all tend to be women between the ages of about 45 and 85. Um, and she says, the line that she uses, she says, I think middle-aged women will save American democracy. You know, so this is, um, so, uh, you know, but this is just one, you know, this is one group. And so I think what, I think there's exactly this point that people are, and this really fed into the 2018 election. I think, I think it is the, or the, yeah, the 2018 election. I think the question is, can this be repeated in 2020? And this is still, I would say, an open question. I want to get some people in the back because I can't, I know I've often sat in the back and get frustrated that nobody calls on me. So I'll, I'm going to, Melissa Eddy in the back with the red shirt on. Thank you. Um, Melissa Eddy, I'm from the New York Times. So I'm going to, since you mentioned newspapers, ask a question about the role of the press in all of this, since we are beholden to the Constitution insofar as the freedom of the press. But what role do you see as being important um, or that you would criticize both in the press in the US and, and here in Germany in terms of legitimizing or not legitimizing these, uh, you know, how many Donald Trump uh, rallies do we show on CNN? Right. You know, do we keep interviewing Gowland or not? How do you see um, the press as playing a role, positive, negative, or otherwise, uh, in this whole process? Yeah, thank you. That's very important. Um, so I think there's, first of all, there's a distinction between journalism and media. Uh, media is a business, journalism's a profession. Um, and, you know, often, I mean, this dynamic of kind of over-reporting of outrageous behavior, which is exactly your point, um, is, you know, maybe driven some by journalists who want it, who are outraged and think this is newsworthy, but it's often also driven, I think, by business interests. I mean, I've spoken to people connected to different media companies who will say, you know, I'll admit, you know, when we report on Trump or Bernie Sanders in the 2016 election, we get a lot more hits. And so, you know, we put these in the headlines. We put Trump's name in the headlines. Um, and so this, this exacerbates this problem. So there is this logic, and that's, you know, the, the nature of a, of a market system in the media, which I'm, I, w I wouldn't 
suggest we get rid of, but there is a, there's a tension there because I think then what happens is there's this um, exaggerated sense or this, this no, the no, you know, New York Times has done very well. Washington Post has done very well in, in response to this era. So my sense, again, in talking to journalists um, is that there has both in, I mean, I've talked to maybe more journalists in Germany than the United States, but in Germany, there's a sense in which people feel as if they overreported early on and have begun to realize, and I think I see a similar thing in the U.S., begun to realize that we need to show discretion, forbearance, in fact, in reporting, and figure out what kinds of things are actually newsworthy and which is just being done, what is just being done to provoke. And we don't want to, you know, journalists ought not be the spokespeople for, for uh, attention desperate people. Um, uh, one challenge, though, I guess, um, and so, you know, I'll say a couple of nice things about the, about journal, I mean, investigative journalism in the United States, at least I know, has, has done wonderfully over the last several years. You know, um, where, you know, there's these incredible prizes, prizes that have been given for great investigative political journalism. Um, I have less of a sense of that in Germany. Um, uh, just because I don't know. I mean, not that it hasn't happened. Um, one other thing, though, I would say that I think is interesting that I've only really become more attentive to since being here this year is the degree to which mainstream media outlets, are they, um, set they F, uh, the main newspapers, simil the similar kind of institutions in the United States. We, you can kind of think of these as establishment media institutions. Historically, they were critical for post-war democracy in a certain way. I mean, if you were a politician and you wanted to get positive coverage, you had to get coverage from these institutions. Um, if you act, it, it, this imposed a set of behavioral norms and in terms of policy substance of, well, of what is out of bounds. I think what's happened is with what, what social media does is it makes it easier to circumvent these media institutions and so that politicians can direct, talk directly to voters. And so, you know, the, the um, Off Day has its own YouTube channel. You can watch Off Day 24 hours a day if you want. I shouldn't be giving them advertising here, but in fact, you can do this. And they, and so I talked to a, a German journalist who said to me, you know, I find that the off day is not really interested in talking to us anymore, and I think it's because they don't need us anymore. Um, and so there's a way in which, you know, and to give you another example from Brazil, uh, in the 2018 presidential election in Brazil, um, uh, my co-author went down to Brazil to talk to some people and right before the presidential election, and uh, the main center-right candidate was, uh, was behind in the polls, but all the businessmen and people he was talking to were saying, you know, we're not really worried about it given how well his parties have done in the past, he gets an hour of free media time, television time every night. Bolsonaro, the outsider with no party, gets 10 seconds of TV time every night. So it's not gonna be a problem. Um, of course, nobody talked about WhatsApp and YouTube. Uh, it turns out Bolsonaro used WhatsApp and YouTube to communicate directly to voters and won the election. So, you know, I think this kind of these, out, these alternatives to mainstream media is a kind of dangerous development. I, th I mean, in some ways it's democratizing, you could say, but it also makes it easier uh, for outsiders who sometimes can go on to attack democratic institutions to connect directly to voters. And so this can be dangerous. And I'm not quite sure how uh, media institutions should be dealing with this. Okay, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeremy, I work at Deutsche Welle, and I want to say I really like the book. I shared it with a colleague, and I also shared it with a friend. We've discussed it. Um, I like the speech again, but I notice that you tend to focus on um, the extremes, like the problems in democracy are coming from the extreme sides. I wanted to ask you a bit about these kind of moderates or centrists. There was a, an article last year in the New York Times, I don't know if you know about this one by David Adler, where he basically, he has done the preliminary research on centrists all over in, in Western Europe, and basically that people who identify as centrists were the least supportive of democratic institutions, um, and were second most likely to support even a far right, like dictator, authoritarian type person. Um, and I basically was curious if you, for example, would have written your book, or would it have had the same premise if, for example, Hillary Clinton had won, who, despite all of the nonsense that was said about her, particularly from Donald Trump, there were very, very legitimate reasons to be criticizing her. And the same with, um, with Barack Obama. There's this kind of, um, there's this kind of invisible 
neoliberal imperialist paradigm that and when you discuss it it's like trying to convince a, a fish that they're in water that is so much uh, part and parcel of American politics now that challenging it uh, leads you to being characterized as some kind of a, of a lunatic so I wanted to ask if yeah if you think that uh, well, what do you what do you think the yeah. role are uh, of um, centrists and these moderate ideologies that um, have kind of given rise to these extreme uh, ideologies well, all over the world, essentially? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, so I think that you raise an interesting point, and I think what the way I think about this is that there's a difference between being on the left and the right or the middle on policy questions. So think about tax policy, health care. You know, let's just hypothetically say you know, a left position is a single-payer system that abolishes all uh, private insurance. A right position is there should be no uh, public insurance whatsoever. A kind of centrist position is some kind of mixed bag in between. That, that's an ideological debate. That's a legitimate debate over policy. Uh, you know, people can legitimately be anywhere on that spectrum. I think there's a cross-cutting divide about whether or not one's committed to the basic rules of the game. Whether, whether one are, is, subscribes to the Constitution and plays by the democratic rules, plays by democratic procedures. That cross, cross cuts, at least in principle, this left-right dimension. I mean, to give you an example, Bernie Sanders, who's nobody's idea of a right-winger, is against filibuster reform. He's a traditionalist when it comes to the procedures of the U.S. Senate. Um, so in principle, you can be on the left and be committed to the democratic institutions. You can be on the right and be committed on, policy, on tax policy, on healthcare policy, and be committed to democratic institutions. And it goes both ways. And so I, I, think, I know this study by, this, uh, by David Adler. I mean, I've seen, I've seen it very briefly. It's based on a, a thesis, I think, that he wrote at Oxford. And, I, and, you know, and so he's finding that people are this, this ideological centrists are, are more supportive of, cert I forget what the questions are to uh, sort of assess your commitment to democratic procedures or your, how appealing you find extremist uh, candidates. And that's, that, that's fine. I don't think that's really, I mean, that, that may make sense. I, don't, I think it just sort of runs cross purpose to this issue. I, 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 have, I think one ought to have legitimate policy debates, but one ought not question the basic rules of democracy. I think, by the way, questioning the filibuster may, is probably a legitimate thing. But whether or not one says, you know, we should limit the right to vote to some segment of the population. This is beyond the pale. This is something about which we can't have a legitimate discussion, from my view. And so I'm interested in, in people who are committed to that, and I don't particularly care about where they've placed themselves ideologically on a left-right policy debate. Yeah, oh, yes, up to the front. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for your for your talk. I have um, two questions, comments. The this is coming from another scientist of politics, so I have to be ready. So um, the first one is about your uh, analysis of the transformation of the Republican Party, and uh, I had the impression that you that it was kind of the the narrative uh, was more or less the decline of the of the white middle class a bit. So, and um, if this is if this is uh, if this is your position there, um, I was wondering whether or not you need to reflect a bit more on on capitalism in the U.S. and how capitalism somehow. Uh, influenced or has affected the way political institutions work um, because I don't think and maybe I mean I'm happy to learn more about this but I don't think that white supremacy in terms of economic or political status has changed so um, so what, what do you mean by that white I mean supremacy? that 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 um, that um, that like uh, that that there is more equality uh, uh, in terms of also like race relations uh, when it comes to to, econ uh, to, to economic uh, to economic questions or okay. to political questions. So, and I was I was wondering um, how you uh, um, how you would uh, how, we, how you would deal with this uh, with this uh, with this point. And the other one is <clears throat> closely related to it. I mean, 
you uh, tell uh, the success uh, success story about the American institutions uh, of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, where this kind of uh, tolerance uh, uh, was uh, was prevalent. But uh, I mean, seen from seen from, for example, uh, the the perspective of uh, uh, of uh, African Americans and uh, and and and. Uh, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and 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 that kind of uh, uh, um, of social strata. I mean, the 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 question is if these institutions and presidents li um, like Nixon or Reagan uh, um, work to uh, uh, maintain a, a, a racialized uh, social and political structure, and uh, if this is uh, kind of a, a very Specific uh, 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 perspective on on the American uh, political history. Yeah, and I guess your question about capitalism I and mean, the kind of neoliberalism point back there, I didn't respond to. So maybe those two things are connected. Um, I, I mean, I, clear, I think economics matter a great deal here. I mean, I don't mean to downplay them. Um, you know, the kind of standard explanations and debate is a bit s sterile in some way between you know about what gives rise to you know, what people call populism in, in Western Europe and the United States, and there's this kind of, dip, you know, one set of views that argue that it's about, you know, maybe globalization or about stagnating wages, increasing economic inequality, um, decreasing social mobility, intergenerational social mobility. I mean, I think the, all of these things, there's evidence that all of these things are problems. They're growing everywhere in the world. It's worse in the U.S. than a lot of other places. Uh, so I think that's a big part of the story. Um, I do think, though, that it's in, this in combination with an increasingly diverse society that provides the raw materials for populists to take advantage of, or, or, or demagogues to take advantage of. So I, so I think the two go hand in hand. Um, you know, I recently saw a, a survey where I think it was seeing that three quarters of East Germans are content with their economic economic situation, but two-thirds of East Germans feel like second-class citizens. And so, you know, is that economics? I mean, it's, you know, probably something about economics, but it's more than about economics. And so it's some kind of, it's this kind of mixture of class and status and culture that provides this kind of combination. Um, and so I think certainly the U.S. is more vulnerable to this because of incredibly high levels of inequality. I think that's right. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, from my view, I mean, this kind of feeds into this, the second question. You know, it's so the, the 1960s were, of course, a transformative era because they expanded voting rights and civil rights, um, and you have increased voter participation. The effects of this, though, took a generation to take hold. I mean, so all of these white Southern Democrats who had been segregationists, the day after the Voting Rights Act and the, the Civil Rights Act passed, were still in office. They stayed around. They figured out how to win. Many of them eventually retired, and it was only by the 1990s that the Republicans won a majority of seats in the U.S. South. So the U.S. South was still essentially a kind of all, you know, it was still dom dominated by, by the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, of course, the, and so the, the, I guess the story that I'm, the way I'm looking at this is that, that the Republican Party now has become a party that because it's 90% of its voters are white uh, in an incredibly diverse society, it's, it perceives itself, or some of its voters perceive themselves as under siege. Whether or that, not that's correct or not, you know, I think it's, I think it's a fantasy at, at some level. I mean, I think it's, you know, and to blame people of a different color skin is, is a complete fantasy. So the objective reality of it in some ways doesn't interest me. I think the reason it has this exaggerated impact in American politics is because this population is so thoroughly concentrated in one political party. And it's exacerbated by politicians. I mean, politicians, in or I mean, democracy requires politicians to know how to lose gracefully. Um, in order to lose gracefully, though, you have to think that if you lose, if you're not going to have calamitous consequences. And you have to also think that you have a chance of winning again in the future. The Republican Party, although it's dominant in American politics today, if you kind of look at the medium term, let alone the long term, given its current makeup, 
it faces a bleak future. So politicians have a lot at stake, I would say, Republican politicians have a lot at stake in restricting the right to vote and shaping uh, how districts are drawn in ways to secure themselves uh, kind of a permanent position. And I, you know, I think that the, in some ways a useful analogy for, in my mind is it perhaps sounds strange is uh, uh, German conservatives in the late 19th century who represented the landed elite, <coughs> aristocratic social order who were frightened of giving the working class the right to vote uh, because this not only would mean that they would loot the these guys who were running parties would lose elections. This also meant the entire aristocratic social order that they were the center of would be overturned. And so I think that there's a perception on the behalf of some Republicans that this is exactly the assault that they're facing. And it's certainly exacerbated, I think, by economics. One more question. One more question. I do very long answers. I apologize. Okay, well, this you've had your hand up for a long time, so I'll go. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Thank you for liking me have the last question. Uh, one question about U.S. politics and one question about German politics. The question about American politics is that the um, talking about the mechanics of the American electoral process, we have seen that you've mentioned before about the fact that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. We still have the electoral college system, and that, that may uh, decide the next American election. And so that is a, an existential problem for, for the United States. I'd like you to talk about that. And on, on the German side, there is an existential problem with the two uh, main parties in Germany. They are at record lows in their support. And I see that as a danger to democracy in this country. Yeah. Um, so that so what on, what on the first question? I, I mean, I agree. If I were designing the American Constitution from scratch, I wouldn't include the Electoral College. Um, but the question of like of, I mean, there was this sort of uh, kind of discussion right after the election. Very serious people saying, "Oh well, now the electors need to act as they were originally intended and overturn the results of the election," which I thought was kind of an ins personally thought was an insane thing because. You know, it was complete constitutional hardball. You know, had the tables been reversed, nobody would have ever argued it. I mean, the same people who were making these arguments, you know, a few years earlier were saying we should abolish the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's, it is, what it's symptomatic of, I guess I would say, is what I think of as, in some ways, a bigger threat to democracy, perhaps, than Donald Trump, which is a kind of creeping counter-majoritarianism in America, where you have the over-representation of minority, so I mean, we, you have essentially minority. I mean, if you have another election that's determined by the electoral college, and you have a Senate in which more Democrats are voting for Democratic senators than Republicans are voting for Republican senators, yet Republicans maintain their majority because of rural states are in a sense overrepresented. The rural voters are in effect overrepresented. You have this kind of pattern, I would say, of minorities being able to dominate the political system. And, and the reason that's obviously concerning is it creates serious problems of legitimacy. I mean, how long will people tolerate that for? I mean, so at some point, people say, you know, one time it happens okay, two times, but if the entire federal government is being governed in this way, and then this affects the Supreme Court as well, this, cre this really creates a problem. If there's, you know, clear majorities tilting one way and minorities nonetheless dominating the system, this is a problem. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure how this gets reformed, I mean, constitutional amendments and so on. So, but I agree that it's a problem. On the second point, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, I've I mentioned I went to high school here and read the, you know, newspapers. I mean, I'm a great admirer of the Volkspartei. I mean, I think these are a great achievement, great contribution to German post-war war society. Um, but as, I, as, as with my description of media institutions, establishment parties are not only in Germany, but everywhere are in decline. Um, like with media institutions, you could say it's somewhat democratizing because you have voters can voting for parties that are closer to them, but it's also dangerous because it allows other parties to get into the system. And I think it turns out Germany's much more robust than lots of other countries. Germany's not, so far at least, is not like France, not like Italy. I mean, the so, so, so I think, you know, this is one of the things that I worry about most. I agree with you that the, 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 the Volkspartei have to remain strong, have to allow, because, you know, as these shrink, the co the, I talked about that there's all sorts of coalitional possibilities possible. These coalitional possibilities get reduced, and it makes, the, it makes it harder and harder to keep out outsiders. So German history teaches us that's a, that's a problem. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.